Um, I want to welcome uh, Katie Hazard. Katie, I didn't take my notes. She's our co-captain of the art team. Is that the right, right title? Central Arts Team, or CAT, as we like to call it in the office. We love acronyms. everyone. Hope you enjoyed the lunch program here. Um, so our session, like he said, is called From Blue Sky to Ground Anchors. And so we're moving from the um, a lot of the logistics you need beforehand, the planning, uh, the paperwork, the copyright, all that stuff, the contracts, and then the fundraising. And now we're moving into the place of talking about really building the art itself. Um, so we're going to spend a little time together today talking about engineering and design and the processes around that for both um, building art at Black Rock City and in a civic context and how we can uh, use engineering and design to plan and advance for encouraging or, encouraging or discouraging different kinds of behaviors for how you might want to design something for the playa um, so that it could be placed off-site afterwards. And I've got Kim right here in the corner of the stage. Um, so I think the only reason I'm popping into your presentation has nothing to do with ground anchors and blue skies, but it does have something to do with settling the room um, because we've just had a transition that happened really fast and there were like little conversations over here and little conversations over there and stuff going on in the back. So I just wanted to invite people who are ready to be present for the next presentation to be here and be present and for people who are not quite ready to do that um, to go quietly out into the back, except since I started doing this, the room got a lot quieter. So um, I love you, and I want you to have people focused. And here we are. Back to you. Thank you. Good call. Uh, so let me introduce the, the fun series of panelists we have here with us today. Uh, we've got Ali, who works for RBHU Engineering, and who has worked with lots of different playa artists. And then we've got PK, who many of you know from the Flux Foundation. He's uh, one of the founding directors of the Flux Foundation, an architect and an artist. And then we have Anna Musig, who is going to speak with us a little more about, um, she's a, an urban planner, and she'll talk with us more about art in a in, in placed off playa. So I'm excited to have the conversation going. We're going to have each one of them spend a little time presenting about their work, and then uh, we'll open it up to questions from everyone. So with that, let's get started with Ali. Um, oh yeah, this, um, is there the clicker for the slides? Hello? Okay. Okay. All right, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to Artist Network Symposium from Blue Sky to Ground Anchors. I'm gonna give you some, um, do you guys hear me all right? Okay. Uh, some tips and consideration in terms of engineering, what ke to keep in mind when you're designing your art structure. First, I'm gonna give you a little background uh, about, here's the slide. Okay, okay. So here's the overview first. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little background about my engineer experiences and more particular, my uh, engineer experiences with Playa Art. Then uh, I'm gonna go through the Burning Man guidelines that they have for safe structure or structural consideration that you need to keep in mind. Um, they have it on the website, but I broke it down with a flow chart. It's hard to a little bit understand on the website, so I made it easier. The criteria that you need to submit and the documents that you need to submit based on the height of the your structure. And then I'm gonna give you a brief overview of what the engineering process looks like. And at the end, I'm gonna give you some tips what to keep in mind when you're designing your structure uh, in terms of engineering, foundation, and the life after Burning Man in terms of engineering. So little overview about me, I'm a senior structural engineer at a company that uh, specializes on offshore wind turbine, floating offshore wind turbines, which is a platform in the middle of the ocean that has a wind turbine on it. Uh, that creative platform really encouraged me to seek for more 
uh, out of the box structure in 2014, I was lucky to be introduced to Peter Hudson and I was able to structurally engineer eternal return with him. After that, I truly fell in love with doing Burning Man art. So me and my friend, Selena Martinez, who uh, had experience doing a lot of Burning Man art, we decided to start our own company, RBA True Rubu, that specializes on large scale art sculptures. Uh, I'm gonna show you some of the notable projects that we have worked on with Rebu. Um, top right is Temple of Promise by Jazz Tinninger, that me and Selena both engineer. The rest of those pictures, I was the lead engineer. Uh, Internal Return with Peter Hudson, um, Shogo Yomoyo with Joshua Hacker, and uh, Lumen Creature with Mark Bolton. Um, these are the projects that Selinda was the lead engineer and she extensively uh, worked with Marco Cochran. Um, the projects are Our Evolution, Truth is Beauty, and Bliss Dance. She also worked on The Story of Haven and The Boot. So um, here are the guidelines that 2016 Burning Man came out with for uh, structural consideration. I uh, it exists on the website, but I break it down so you guys could get an understanding of what this looks like. You should definitely go to the website and check out uh, what these criteria are and read it thoroughly. Um, so Burning Man Arts would likely require this information um, based on the height and also whether or not it has a platform for human interaction or does not. In this slide, I'm gonna go over uh, the platform, uh, the structures that do not have a platform for human interaction. So if you're, and I'm gonna zip through it because we don't, we are short in time. Um, if your structure is zero to 10 feet, they required uh, structural drawings, uh, architectural drawings and installation and installation plan. If your structure is between 10 to 15 feet, in addition to the information for 10 to 15, 10 to 15 feet, you need to provide what material you're planning to use for your structure, what structural members you're planning to use, uh, the size of them and the quantity of them, and uh, the anchor sizes and what calculation led to those anchor sizes. If your structure is 15 to 20 feet, in addition to this information, you need to provide uh, construction drawings, uh, load calculation so they can see you have put thought into it and calculated the loads and rigging calculation if it's applicable. Uh, if your structure is 20 to sky or above 20 feet, uh, you need to provide the full on engineering calculation and if it's partial calculated, you need to justify why. Um, now if your platform, ha uh, if your structure has a platform for human interaction, and the criteria is a bit uh, tougher. So for example, uh, whatever document that you need to submit for zero to 10 feet that uh, is, has a platform is sa same as uh, the platforms that are zero, uh, 10 to 15 feet that are not manned. Uh, it's a bit complicated, you need to read it. And if you have any question, please let me know. Um, so give you an overview of the engineering process. First, we get the architectural drawings or even back of an envelope drawing that shows you the dimension that you're planning to use or the 3D model. Uh, engineers take that, they build their structural model which is strictly for analysis and calculation. Um, after that, they apply, they set up their model, they run the global analysis by applying the wind load, gravity loads, um, human loads, and then from that analysis, they're able to size the members that you're planning to use for your structure and the anchor sizes that you're, and the number of anchors that you're supposed to use. And if there are um, bolt connection or some critical connection, we do detailed design to make sure they're adequate. Uh, at the end, uh, engineer produce a structural drawing that explains all the structural members, their sizes, even to bolts and nuts. Um, now, I'm going to give you some design tips, what to keep in mind when you're designing your art structure. Um, so first is that you need to start the engineer early. Uh, engineering could take a long time depending on how large is your stru structure. Um, 
it could take up to a few months if there is a lot of back and forth. So keep that in mind, the engineering could take a long time. Try to finalize your design as much as possible before you give it to the engineers. Don't think that, oh, I will give it to them, let's see what they think, and we'll keep, uh, keep the process open and keep changing it, because if you make drastic like, changes to your structure, that would, might mean that the engineers have to start the analysis over, and it would take time, and it would cost money. Um, in order to avoid that, create a 3D model of your structure. There are a lot in the computer. There are a lot of free programs out there that you could use, like SketchUp, uh, Inventor for Artists is free, and AutoCAD 3D student version is free. Uh, one step after that, it would be to make the actual scale model of your structure. Uh, nowadays, you could just email your 3D model, and there are a lot of companies that print it, 3D print it, and send it back to you, or do it old-fashioned way using clay or any medium that you're comfortable with. Um, something to also keep in mind, less solid surface areas that are subjected to wind, less forces on your structure, less bulky would be your member sizes. Um, so keep that in mind when you're designing. For example, if you have a mesh uh, structure, 50% open, meaning that 50% of the wind goes through your structure, you have 50% less forces. Um, do not give up. So if you talk to one engineer and they say that, uh, yeah, your design is not possible, try to talk to a few other engineers it is possible that that engineer doesn't have experience with out-of-the-box uh, structures, so pick other people's brain. Um, try to really understand what the problem is with your structure, and try to prioritize the features you're willing to give up to make your structure work. So all these thinking ahead would help you spit out your design. Um, now I'm gonna give you some tips, what to keep in mind about the foundation. Um, a lot of people think like tent-like structures, they think the wind only hits them in a direct way. There is no uplift force, meaning that there is no force that pulls your structure up. It's not true, wind does crazy thing. It goes underneath and pulls the structure off. Please keep that in mind. Um, you could weigh down your structure instead of using anchors, but it's not really advised for large sculptures because you need to bring a lot of weight, typically concrete, um, blocks, you have to bring it to the playa and bring it back. Some artists have thought about using playa dust and sandbag to weigh down their structure, but playa, uh, Burning Man doesn't allow you to use playa dust and, uh, as a weight. Um, plan for bearing plates. Bearing plates are typically uh, sheets of steel or sheets of plywood that you put underneath your structure. On the playa, playa is sand, your structure could sink in. And if, uh, if there is rain, it would sink in even more. So be careful with that. Design your uh, foundation that it could be installed anywhere after Burning Man. So keep that in mind that it's, you're not only designing it for Burning Man. Um, some other tips for, future, uh, for the future of your art structure is that think about the transportation. Domestically, you're restricted to the size of the flatbed truck. And for internationally, you're restricted to the size of a container. Figure out what those sizes are, think about it early. Um, most typically, uh, art, uh, public art, they require you to have stamp drawing or calculation based on the code. So try to talk to the engineers to who are a license or design your structure based on the code. Um, thank you very much. I went through these slides pretty quickly. Uh, if you have any question, please email me at ali at rbhu.org, and I will be happy to help you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Ali. And now, PK. I'm PK. I'm founder of the Flux Foundation. Um, I've been up to the playa, I don't know, 18 years now. Um, so I have a decent amount of experience before I started making large-scale art. <laughs> I'm, I'm not weak. <laughs> Guys? Oh.
There we go. Okay. So, <clears throat> Flux was founded in 2010 with the commission uh, to do the temple, and so I'm going to try to illustrate a bunch of things that Ali said and set up Anna for our next conversation. Um, over the past six years, we've done a variety of projects, both on and off the playa. The Temple of Flux was designed as an idea that we wanted to create community, not only its process, but also in its product. So it's a series of canyons, um, a bunch of materials that interface between the natural environment and the built environment, referencing that the fact that the city um, stemmed out of our inhabitation of caves and canyons. Um, so it's a highly corroborative process. We had 200 people work on the project. We did massive crowdfunding, as you heard earlier. Um, but for us, um, the temple is an opportunity to really get people together in engagement to talk to each other, um, both as we made it as well as in the space itself. So it's very focused on the space as opposed to it just being an object. Uh, the reference here is you know, the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem where you are confronted by an object that is so big that you are so small um, that it's an awe-inspiring experience, which is important to us. Um, so this idea of awe shrinks you down, makes you have more in common with the people around you. Uh, you can see the scale of it here. This is the day before we finished, I think. So you can see the remnants of the camp. Half of the crew has already left. So you can see the scale of the enterprise. But what I want to show to you is actually to address what Ali was talking about. Most people didn't get to see this. This is the structure of the element. It's 117 giant triangles. Um, we were limited to, like Ali said, the length of a flatbed truck. So no member can be longer than 48 feet. Um, some, we were lucky we got a 50 feet, 53 foot truck for some of them. Um, and they are ground anchored. So um, there are these four foot screws in the ground that hold everything in. Uh, the spacing between the triangles, for example, is limited by the width of the plywood. And so we're designing all these factors into the component um, while worried uh, about the artistic integrity and how to get people together and make the spectacular thing. So it's quite a wrestling match. This is the inside of it that no one ever got to see. You burn it down, and I want to address the difference between things that are designed to burn and things that are permanent, because they are a big factor when you're working as an artist. Um, burning something now gives you this moment in time um, that allows you to expose something new. Here we got to expose the structure, um, and choreographing, choreographing a burn is an event in itself. And these events that you'll see, um, not only was it the guy hanging by rope, um, create also a special moment where people come together. Um, so for example, when, before we burned it, we actually had to loosen all the ground anchors and the cabling. We took half the bolts out um, so that it would burn and actually fall in a methodology that we wanted. So the, it dominoed. Um, and we did that by playing certain tricks with the structure. So it was safe the entire time it stood, but it, when it fell, it fell the way we wanted to. This was our crew before we formally became involved uh, as Flux and founded Flux. This is an earlier piece that was designed for the playa, but it continually gets shown off playa. It's actually the way we make a lot of our finances work is by showing playa work off playa. And this is the interior. It's about creating a space where people can come in and gather and now it has hammocks inside of it so that you can become a living part of the organism. Um, I'm sorry? That's called fish bug. Now it's 2.5. Um, this is uh, something we did for a BRAF event, um, which is called Spire Wishes, which is a recycled lumber, which is a totally different ball of wax structurally. Um, the Temple Flux used how to use real lumber for the structure, and then the skin was recycled because you can't calculate um, recycled lumber is very difficult to do, but we have to think about the context in which it sits. So that was actually built for a flat ground, and then we moved it to its final resting place. Um, we actually dug into the ground to allow it to sit and level. It in its design is both an object, but more importantly, a giant bench that lets people sit and commune with each other. Um, so again, this idea of coming together and designing pieces that have lifespans beyond the playa is important to us, as well as creating place and creating community. This is called Brawley Flock. So it was designed for both Coachella and Burning Man, because we didn't know where it would go, where the proposal would be accepted. Um, and in both cases, it uses fire, mist, and water as a sort of creation of spectacle to you know, allow people beneath it to come together. Um, so it was originally designed to use ground anchors, as Ali mentioned, um, but civic sites, as Anna will probably address, um, don't like you making permanent maneuvers into their ground. 
Um, so we use giant pieces of road plate underneath. Um, and modularity becomes really important that these things can come apart and be shipped and also reconfigured. So this is a, another piece for Coachella where we're doing structural gymnastics. The exterior slats of wood actually hold the thing up. Um, but in this case, at Coachella, like the playa, you're able to dig into the ground, and that's not always possible. Um, and we use these things for effect to create spaces that people can come together. Um, so we're thinking about the process throughout um, with art artistic goals about creating social space and creating ads that look like they're for X body spray um, all along, <laughs> um, uh, which is all natural. So this is another project that sort of fuses these ideas together. This is for the theme of evolution, which was, I don't remember if it was 2012 or 13, um, where we really explore the idea of event um, and evolution. It was fertility or evolution. It was one of the two. Um, so it was this idea of a piece unfolding over time and people getting to experience it at different levels. It was highly interactive, had sound and motion sensors. Um, and then it burned. So this idea that there were these alien sort of seeds and that were natural um, sort of were there. And when it burns away, um, there's an event. It shot off these giant seeds. There's a spectacle. Everyone goes, wow, wh wh did you just see that? And unless you talk to your neighbor. Um, and then you have these, uh, what we call the new morphs, these sort of objects that were inside of it the entire time. They then light up and they have interactive panels and they shoot fire. So for us, what I wanna harp on here is the modularity. We have subsequently shown these pieces, um, but sometimes we show them one by themselves, sometimes in many um, combinations. So that becomes really important because financing, as you heard earlier, is a huge part of what you do in project management. So having a, the forethought to think all this through, where is it gonna go next, what is it gonna do next, is important. Um, so that you can show these things, raise money, and do all the sorts of things that you do as an artist in addition to make beautiful objects. So this idea of creating, we've done work beyond the playa um, as well. This is an installation for the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. But it takes the same idea of manipulating and manip uh, uh, you can raise and lower all 107 umbrellas um, and you create different, the people can create different patterns that responded to function. Um, when we weren't there, students would do all sorts of crazy things to them, um, which was great to see, just like the playa, people having free interaction. So the work is inspired by the activity of the playa, but also has a civic gesture. So here we pop these umbrellas out to the city front and try to encourage people to engage um, as it's a public space beyond. That umbrella, so this is a perfect example of how these things have lives. Um, the umbrella sculpture uh, was installed in a new variant, which had been designed all along for the possibility to do this um, at this Philadelphia Zoo um, for almost a year. So all the elements that were interactive and effect-based, like fire and such, were replaced by um, objects that could exist permanently outside. So thinking about how your project can be transformed over time to not be just event-based, as in on the playa, but also be permanently installed has become an increasingly important part of our work. And I would encourage other people to think about it that way. The th this got the re-themed to address sustainability. So all the parts are recycled, which is really important to us, including the structural steel and the structural design, um, which was not only cost-effective, but about the topic. Um, so you see the road plates showing up again because we weren't allowed to dig into the ground, that's often an issue. This is Lacuna, which will come back up for the Bay Area Festival of the Book. And I include this because we, it's on historic Julia Morgan pavers and they don't let us touch it. So um, that's important to understand. Uh, and the last work I want to address is this was Carousel, which was an interactive piece we did for Harvard. And then it was designed all along to become our last most recent piece, part of our most recent piece at Dreamland which was at Burning Man last year, which was an homage to Coney Island, this idea of civic space and interactivity and games. Um, you'll see these sort of images alluded to there. So this is an interesting example. You can see the structural steel members and you can see the old carousel sitting in the center. So we've been using it and manipulating it in different componentry and different modules. Um, part of it is actually going to Maker Faire um, and we're trying to install it permanently elsewhere. Um, if you have any leads, that'd be great. Um, so the idea of the boardwalk of civic, civic nature is sort of what makes this thing really special. We're very interested in, in creating public space and doing, dealing with civic space. Um, so the whole piece, the wood, is designed to actually be lifted up six inches so that it can be structurally installed elsewhere. 
Um, I just wanted to show you quickly the ske the way we work, which is these sketches, um, ideas become models, like Ali said, which become renderings to test out geometry, which become, these are literally the drawings that gets, got submitted to Burning Man. Um, so I just wanted to give an overall process about how we engage, and uh, I'll leave it to Anna to address the civic issues a little more. Thanks so much, PK. Yeah. And Anna, looking forward to hearing from you too, thanks. Oh, hey guys, how's it going? Um, I think it might take them a second to get my presentation up because it's in a different format. <clears throat> um, so I'm excited to be on this panel. Um, I am trained as an urban planner and have a background in public art production and curation. So my background is a little bit different, um, but I'm really excited to be here because actually having never been to Burning Man, um, I see it as a great source of inspiration for the type of work that I do in cities, which is trying to get people to relate to each other differently um, and change their relationship to their built environment. So while we're waiting to get my slides up, this is the slide that I'm looking at is my last slide, not my first slide. Maybe I'll ask you to think about your favorite Burning Man art experience that you have ever had, the thing that just blew your mind, like changed the way that you saw your relationship with yourself, with your people, with the world around you. And think about how that would feel in your neighborhood. Like, could you have that in your neighborhood, in your favorite park, on your street corner? Would the impact be the same? Would it be different? Um, would it raise the same type of question? So those are some of the things that I'm really interested in talking about today. So. Um, I'm here to talk about civic art and what that means to me and some of my background um, on this topic. So who cares? What is, why civic art? Why not just art for art's sake? Um, there's definitely a whole world of art for art's sake out there. Um, abstract ex expressionists in the 50s were really obsessed with just removing all sense of sort of formal meaning and just focusing on just the form of the work. Um, I really think that our cities and our, our world around us has so many things that we need to focus on that are political and have to do with changing our relationship to each other and, and the world around us. So I'm really interested in what this idea of a civic artist. So this is a picture of Joseph Boys, um, maybe one of the most sort of uh, common people when people think about what is a civic artist, he had this idea that um, actually a, an art is not an art, an art is not an art object. In fact, the, the moment of transformation, the thing that we should focus on is the relationship between each other. Um, actually, the whole, the whole world could be an art. He had this idea of social sculpture. So that's sort of where, how I start and actually how I look at a lot of artwork, even that does have incredible physical form. Um, it, it also, uh, it has to do with our relationships with one another. So I decided to break down just a couple of ideas of what a civic artist could be. Um, the first is a Rookin figure. Does anyone here speak German? Know what that means? It means something like uh, the person in front of you. And it's an artistic technique meant to bring the viewer into an experience. So the painting here is not actually about the, the person standing on the ledge. It's about putting you, the viewer, into a new space. So one way to be a civic artist is to lead by example, to show others how to be freer, how to be more kind and so on in society. An example of that um, is this group called uh, the Space Hijackers. They're based in London. They do this thing in the square mile of London called the Anarchist versus the Capitalist Midnight Cricket Test Match. And they like, all get real drunk with um, the, the, the capitalists, all the bankers that are in the square mile of London, and then they trick them into totally transforming their relationship with public space through sports. They also do, did something called the Circle Line Party on London Circle Line. Another example, this is uh, an image from uh, Improv Everywhere called Conduct Us. This is the Carnegie Hall Orchestra, and they just had a, a, a bunch of little oh, batons and asking people to conduct them, and they would just start and stop according to whomever conducted them. So they are a very good example of, a, of a, someone who leads by example. Then, of course, Antonis Macus was the mayor of Bogota, Colombia, actually hired 240 mimes to walk people across the street and chastise bad drivers. That's a good art. 
Um, another way to be a civic artist is to shine a light on invisible systems or tell better stories about people and places using beauty and provocation. This is an image of Eve Mosher chalking the historic flood line in Brooklyn <clears throat> to give light to this invisible system. Another good one is Hunter Franks. I don't know if he's here, but uh, he's a local artist um, who did a neighborhood postcard project that asked people from the Tenderloin, a neighborhood where people are sometimes misunderstood, wrote postcards and sent them to places like in North Beach um, and made some real connections between people in different neighborhoods. Another way uh, to be a civic artist is to provoke discussion and sometimes it isn't always nice. I don't know if you guys have noticed some of the posters in our neighborhood here in the mission um, provoking conversation around um, gentrification using classic um, aggressive tactics like this. So engagement and critique. Uh, this is Steve Lambert's Capitalism Works for Me, yes or no? Uh, this is William Popel, The Great White Way. He crawled the entirety of Broadway over nine years. It's 22 miles. Um, oh, five minutes, thank you. And then, of course, use art as an organizing tool. So use it as a tool for community development and wealth generation in a neighborhood. This is Theaster Gates, uh, uh, the Dorchester Project. So really using art as like a vehicle to do all this other stuff that you want. That's sort of what Burning Man is to me. And then uh, Jason Roberts of Better Block, which does pop-up pop up sort of Im improvements in neighborhoods. Um, he talks about actually the ultimate end of tactical urbanism is buying property. So that's a way of using art and instigation to really build a new world, struggle like permanently. Okay, so that's great. That's really conceptual. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, so here are some projects that I've worked on. Um, I was part of a collective called Nuit Blanche New York. We did a couple of different projects in New York City. The first was, or the second, well, it's the coolest, so I'm gonna show it first, um, was projecting on the new museum on the Bowery, a neighborhood that has experienced incredible gentrification over the last 20 years. Um, the new museum seen as part of that gentrification and yet is a place um, to really showcase art uh, of which there, there's a, hist a historical legacy in the Bowery. So how do you turn the museum inside out? Well, <clears throat> Um, you build a number of scale replicas. Uh, the one on the left uh, was at a certain scale, pretty big. That's one of my favorite graffiti artists, Tony Bones, writing his little thing up there. And then we also made a couple of other scale replicas that were smaller and then another one that was 2D. And we asked people to manipulate the building and then we projected it back on the building um, using a number of high lumen projectors, which people here in this room probably know more about than I do. So this was done at, on the New Museum for two nights as part of the uh, Festival of Ideas for the New City. We paired it with a number of other different installations at different scales, including dance performances, other projection art. We also did a project um, on the contested waterfront of, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, in Red Hook. This is um, Richard Serra's uh, Lead Drops and then invited like 75 different artists to use yet light to totally transform that space. We shut down all of the light. We worked with DPW and the city um, to illuminate all the street lights and allowed only the artist projection to illuminate the street. So some lessons. Use your work to empower others, um, bring other people into the process, really engage with the site, tell a story about where you're working. Think at multiple scales, even if you're working at a really spectacular scale, which is an important way to connect to people, think about how they might feel in their body on the street. Uh, always avoid plop art. Always try to work with systems that you're, that you're engaging with, like work with the city, work with DPW, work with the Department of Buildings to challenge the systems in our city. In fact, um, city planning is an art, as the way I see it. Another project that I've worked on um, as part of the Better Market Street plan, which is a plan to repave Market Street soon. Um, Gale Studio, which is a studio that I work for, uh, was involved in the large scale, uh, the urban design component of that plan in the process of community organizing around what this project should be, what Better Market Street should look like. One of the first priorities for the community was placemaking. Well, how do you do that when the, when the goal of a street redesign is actually transportation connectivity? One of the things that we came up with uh, was the idea of streetlets, a new type of way to live on the street. How can the street be a place, not just a place to get through? So of course, you prob all probably know about living innovation zone. Um, a lot of people in this room, I think, worked on that project. Um, this is one of the examples of uh, that the Exploratorium uh, commissioned a set of parabolic disks that allows you to speak at the, at the scale of a whisper to the person sitting across from you. 
part of this project is also the Market Street Prototyping Festival, which started with this organization, Gray Area, um, and is now working on Market Street, hell yeah. So um, our role in this project was to evaluate the success, and I'm gonna share with you a couple of things that we learned and then I will be done. Um, this is what the Market Street Prototyping Festival looked like for those of you who weren't there. It was 50 different submissions on the street, using the street as a place, um, as a place for performance, a place for interaction, and a place that actually a lot of people didn't think um, there would be room for this type of activity. But there really was. Um, some of the things that we learned is that uh, positive, block co positive perception of the block correlates with more people using it. There were many, many more people, people on the street during the festival than normal, um, and a huge increase of people lingering and spending time. More invitations for older people and younger people, and most people happened upon the event. They didn't intend to go there. So something that I'd love to talk about is who, who's our audience in these projects, and how do we engage with people who don't intend to go there. We came up with our criteria for success for each of the prototypes and then ranked them. I think one of the things that we can talk about a little, well, I think I should probably get to the end. If we want to talk about what makes a good prototype, we can, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, some of the lessons that came from the evaluation of the Market Street Prototyping Festival last year are, even if you want to, don't hijack the street. Give m people multiple ways to engage. It's sort of like the standard idea of prospect and refuge. What makes you interested? So you want to be able to feel safe, but also um, be able to see out. Be generous to your audience, and then some design pattern that really works. So that really worked included uh, permeable street rooms, having a visual beacon from afar and an intimate scale up close, um, be able to view other people, many ways to sit and stay a while, and then making sure your, your project has meaning beyond just its um, sort of structural elements. So I've been told to stop. I'll stop. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. So we've been through quite a range here. Really, when we say from blue sky to ground anchors, we sort of went from ground anchors through to blue sky. Um, but I would like the folks here to have a chance to ask questions of these three folks. There's a lot of interesting experience that we've got here. Um, and if you wouldn't mind raising the house lights again, as we did earlier this morning, it's nice to um, feel like everyone's here included in this conversation and it's not, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so, question. So the question is, is this on? Is this one? So the question is this one. <laughs> the question is, I know I turned it off. OK. Um, so the question is, how do we approach multiple sites? Um, there is a couple different issues out there, which is, you know, there's the prototypical, as we've seen, um, transition from Burning Man to other festivals, and we know what those sort of outlines are and their restrictions. Um, but there's also a broader conceptual problem of how do you make socially engaged art and, and um, in a broader context. Um, so some of what uh, Lee talked about, I hope to address, you know, structurally, but conceptually, it's our focus on community and the creation of community, something I didn't address earlier is um, the way we at Flux actually make art is a highly collaborative process where there's not a singular designer. I don't sketch on a napkin and poof to other people and make it. Um, we work with each other and in the process we train other people in how to make art. Um, and so the artwork itself is a product of community and then sort of like Anna said, um, the, uh, pro the artwork itself through interactivity um, for required collaboration then engenders this notion of community. So by using a broader topic um, such as community enables us to engage no matter who the audience is. Um, and like Dreamland and all those pieces, they all have buttons on them. 
Um, that's my New York accent. Um, and so pressing the buttons in different sequences or all together or getting other friends to collaborate then creates different spectacular effects. And so you're able to commune with people you don't know all throughout the process in building the object and the object itself. Oh, my, yeah, I'll repeat the question. So the question was, uh, how did we really engineer the Temple of Flux um, in both regards to structural considerations but also people climbing it? People climbing artwork is a, always a hot topic amongst artists, and I'll sort of sidestep that a little bit and just to say that we need to create a culture at Burning Man that respects the art in the same way that we have a culture that respects the environment with Moop and things like that. Um, and ad advocacy about consideration of the artwork is important. Um, so to address directly, the Temple of Flux was skinned in a material so thin that no one in their right mind would ever try to climb it. Yet, lo and behold, people did, and people fell through the skin, um, all the while saying, it's interactive, it's, you know, I can do whatever I want, and there's a certain point that we make, and you know, I'll sort of alluded to this, um, things like handles and things encourage climbing, and we do what we can to minimize climbing with things like really flimsy materials, or in Dreamland, I don't know how many people saw it, there was a fabric that essentially s visually stopped people from climbing the structure. We were really worried about people climbing up top and spinning around. Um, with uplift, so that fabric served a purpose. So you try to design these things into it. Um, the structure of the temple, um, I'm an architect, um, so I'm very fortunate to understand how these things work. Um, but we did work with an engineer, and like for example, you saw the, the way that the skin is open. Ali referred to this. Um, as you saw the dramatic pictures of the lighting, it was to illuminate from outside and foreshadow the burning, but it was also so that we could allow wind to come through the structure. Um, and we designed for 80 mile an hour winds, and we actually we designed for more than that, and it got up to that year really being really windy. Um, and the structure actually did move. Um, when we went to burn it down, we noticed. But of course, we designed safety all along, and we had the math to do it. So I guess to repeat the question, when is a good point to give the engineer your idea or your model for engineering? Um, I would say that cosmetic things to the structure that could, that's irrelevant from engineering, so that could be happening during the process, but the things that uh, backbone of the structure needs to support, um, that needs to be to somewhat finalized um, for example, we had someone come to us and say, oh, I want a tree to make it build a tree, but I don't know really what size I want it to be, and I want it to be beautiful, and those are the things that we needed more information. So what makes a tree beautiful? What heights, uh, what dimensions, what material do you imagine it to be? So these are a little bit, um, before thoughts that you need to put into, and creating 3D model really helps with that because you see your imagination come into some sort of virtual life. Then from virtual life, it comes to real world through your um, scale, physical scale model. Thank you. Good, well, I wanna really thank the three of you so much for spending the time sharing your experience and your expertise with all of us and 
Thank you as well for being here and listening and doing all you do. So with that, we'll turn it over to the next crew. Thank you.